This is a follow-up to the session we just finished on peace and human security. That was from the conceptual strategic point of view, and this is from the operational point of view of uh, how we effectively uh, implement uh, complex integrated concepts. And there's a little history behind this, this, this session, which I'd like to narrate to put it in perspective. For the last five years since we had our first, six years since we had our first conference at the UN in Geneva, we've been looking at the complex interactions and interdependencies between the different sectors, the political, economic, social, cultural, ecological, technological dimensions, and trying to figure out both for education, for research, and for implementation, how do we deal with this, uh, the, the reality of this complexity through institutions that are so firmly divided. Uh, the, uh, the implementation agencies, the specialized agencies that are in, in, involved with departments of government, where they're involved with policy making, the educational system, which is dividing our disciplines. And even if we go back to the intellectual conceptions and the theories uh, on which our education is based are so fragmented from one, one another. Our thinking is fragmented. Our theory is fragmented. Our education is fragmented. Our policy making is fragmented and our specialized departments for implementation are fragmented. Uh, and how are we going to handle the complexity of in implementing the SDGs, for example, when we know very clearly how interdependent they are on one another. Uh, and whatever we do at one end, if we don't follow it all the way back to thought and theory and education and uh, research and policy making, uh, we're, we're not going to end up with the results that we're looking for. So on this thinking about two and a half years ago, we had a meeting with the Ban Ki-moon, this was just after he retired as the uh, Secretary General of the UN, and proposed to him a concept for what we called an integrated research and implementation agency. And uh, we are, our, our concept was that integration means we have to not only integrate horizontally across disciplines, which we refer to as, we refer to as transdisciplinarity to mean it's not just putting everything together in a pot, but it's really looking at how everything is interrelated with each thing. But we also need to integrate from the conception, the theory and the research all the way through implementation. And could we conceive of a type of organization that would make that possible? And we came up with a, a framework, a, a conceptual model for it. Uh, it was purely a concept uh, and in which we took and involved all the stakeholders that are involved from conception through implementation and all the disciplines that are involved uh, in, uh, a, in addressing an issue. And from the beginning, they work together. So both horizontally and vertically, so to speak, uh, the team would be involved in, in an integrated way. And we raised this for discussion at the conference we had in December at the UN and had a very interesting discussion. That session was uh, with uh, uh, Michael Muller, who was the Director General of the UN in Geneva at the time we started our global uh, leadership project. And one month after signing the agreement with us, Michael retired from the UN and went off the map for a while. And uh, we learned in December that what he's been doing for the last one year is working with an organization, GESDA, which is Geneva science 
science diplomacy. Diplomacy, thank you for that. Diplomacy anticipator. And we had a long discussion with uh, Michael, a wonderful discussion with Michael after the Geneva Conference, after we'd learned about what he was doing. And it turned out when he read our concept paper written two and a half years ago, he said, well, this is exactly what we're doing. Uh, and Gesta is at the, not pilot stage, they're in the takeoff stage, but they're only a one year old baby still in which they are testing this, not with respect to the SDGs in total, not with respect to human security, but the same model being applied to looking at the applications and implementation, in, in, implications of new emerging technologies uh, and tracing it through. And so we have a special session uh, tomorrow where Michael's going to talk to us, talk, uh, this is the, the, the keynote lecture tomorrow, presenting the model and their experience in the startup stage. Uh, but we thought it would be useful conceptually if we could help you, you could help us brainstorm on how do we overcome this challenge, which is there not only with respect to technology, not only respect to human security, but virtually with respect to everything that has a social and an ecological implication, like the pandemic uh, is, a, is a classic example. We don't need to go further than that. So I'm inviting a discussion uh, on, uh, on how do we close the gaps? Uh, IAP, we have two representatives of IAP who are certainly trying to close an important gap between the research and the implementation, bringing uh, groups together from different academies and actually looking at projects in the field that can close that gap. And we know how difficult that is. Uh, and we know of, uh, interdisciplinary teams in different disciplines that are trying to close some of the intellectual gaps that we have, which in the social sciences, we are very, very far from closing. Uh, we've still got, uh, I think the, the, the natural sciences are far ahead because essentially you cannot build models of chemistry or geology unless you get your physics right but you can build beautiful econometric models of the economy on premises about human behavior that have nothing to do with the way people actually behave, at least not the ones that I know, uh, including myself. So uh, there is an, an inherent integration of knowledge in the natural sciences. I'd say one reason because it's much easier, less complex <laughs> than human beings are. Uh, but uh, we're way ahead uh, simply because the complexity is, is greater and the, the social sciences are younger. But we still have this challenge of putting both the dimensions together. So this is a subject for brainstorming. We would ex uh, in, appreciate, I know Jerry has great experience in, uh, in looking at problems from a multidimensional standpoint and, uh, and trying to understand that complexity in the Millennium Club. Uh, so I think each of us brings a different perspective to it. Uh, Katan, with his vast experience in business and finance and management and strategy uh, and implementation uh, from the, the business point of view, I wanted to just encourage us to think together uh, and share your views on how, what are the issues we need to grapple with in, over, in, in, able, in order to overcome this? Uh, and how much of it is a structural problem? How much is it an operational problem? How much is it an intellectual problem? Because in the academy, we've really been working at the intellectual level to understand uh, something more fundamental about the way society works, the way society evolves. Uh, the way the different sectors of, of, of social existence are interdependent with one another. But now we're trying to go, if we want to take a transdisciplinary approach from idea to action, we need an organizational model that matches the consciousness of the perspective 
Otherwise, we'll end up fragmenting everything again as we go down the line. So unlike uh, some of the other sessions, this is really a think tank. <laughs> and I would just invite questions, comments, uh, experiences, perspectives, or whatever comes to your mind. Would anyone like to start? Maybe I do. Yes. Dr. Law, please. Yes. Well, thank you very much. And uh, you already have uh, mentioned about IEP and also about the multidisciplinarity in sciences, in natural sciences. And there nowadays, IEP in particular is very keen that our knowledge in different sciences should be synthesized in such a way that society benefits from. And one example, recent example was that with the initiative leadership of Volker Thermulin, we had a big project on food, nutrition, security and agriculture, which is very relevant and so on in most countries, particularly those which are not so developed. So we could connect the whole globe into this. We could divide into Asia, Africa, Europe, Americas, and then create uh, uh, synthesize whatever knowledge existed and whatever can be realized in future. That is one model. I am not saying this is all. But what I compliment you is that in your this uh, forum, this organization, your was, you have integrated humanities much more than we do in IEP. So I think it is far more challenging and to make a synthesis where you can go into this. But few things I would like to mention because in science, there is a lot of inhomogeneity. Inhomogeneity in the sense that, for example, we can't say the entire African continent has been connected with us. There are many countries we don't have an academy. We, IEP tries to help them to create academies so that they integrate into the system. It's not only Africa, I'm more worried about Asia also. Some parts of Asia, particularly the Arabian Peninsula and West Asia, this part hardly has any academy. They are trying now, but hardly has any academy. And for example, in the Aral Sea, there is a lot of problem, the sea is receding. And there is a lot of problem on agriculture and so on. But so far, maybe because of political and other issues, the total scientific input we should go into such problems, I'm not saying the only problem, needs a, a relook. We, we can do much more, but we have not done sufficient. So if we look at the social, science, social sciences, connect them into it, our impact globally will enhance considerably. There is, uh, this is what I feel about it. And that is perhaps I compliment your was for doing all these things. And this will be very useful for it. Second thing which we want to, I want to mention is that one thing which uh, uh, IAP realized and it has succeeded in to some extent creating a global young academy. So we have younger people. And now in the present uh, situation, they have also a place in our executive uh, board. And we will like to have them in our next uh, General Assembly play a serious role. So this uh, brings uh, us into a new way of uh, functioning into this thing. But at the same time, once again, I would say there are challenges, both in many parts of the world, including Africa, some parts of Asia. And 
also maybe some parts of South America also. South America right now, from scientific point of view, has more problem than most people realize. But with combination of scientific uh, knowledge, with combination of realization that we have to work together and also possibly to bring social sciences into it to create a system which solves problem, which helps humanity uh, solving some persistent problems, be it health and so on. Even in this COVID period, IAP was very, very active. It had many groups because we had some of the top scientists coming into it, younger, middle level and higher, and created several statements, reports and so on. And they have been very well received. So we have a system where scientific body, the excellence in science comes together, focuses on problems which are facing humanity and would like to also enlarge its canvas to increase other science, social science and other departments of knowledge so that we have a bigger impact globally and really help in uh, creating solutions which uh, help people. So to begin with, I leave it here. And if some more discussion goes, I'll be very much uh, happy, glad to join and once again, thank you. Thank you. Jerry, would you like to? Yeah. Um, the, the good news is that the idea of human security as an organizing principle for the future of international affairs and global affairs seems to be acceptable to the right wing and left wing over the last 20 years that I've checked this out. So that's, that's not bad. I think that's an important point that should be held somewhere. Secondly, I worry about uh, the short-term thinking. Um, there are long-term threats to the species as a whole. And I think that the short-term, like pandemic is not gonna wipe out the whole human species. The short-term part of global warming won't wipe out the human species either. Longer term, that's a different issue, but. And I worry that, as, as we all know, the short term always overrules the long term. So one of the things I would suggest is either inside human security apparatus, there's a specific unit for long term strategic threats, or we set up a separate UN office specifically for long term existential strategic threats. And what do I mean? I want to underline this a little bit. Obviously, one everybody knows is nuclear war. That's clear. But there's some other ones that are not so clear. For example, the Millennium Project, we did a study and showed that it looks like in 10 years or so, it may be possible for a single individual acting alone to create a synthetic biology bioweapon to wipe out the species. That's not a 0% chance. And I don't see a whole lot of attention on that one, but that's important. But see, human security might not talk about that unless you specifically say long-term. Another one, for example, artificial, when, when Elon Musk and the rest of these guys uh, worry about artificial general intelligence, not the narrow intelligence we have now, but the future one, if you don't get it, the initial conditions right, possibly as early as 10 to 15 years, may not be that fast, but we should look at the worst case, so to speak. If you don't get those initial conditions right, it could involve into the superintelligence that all the science fiction is worrying about. And, and the way to get, we, we got to deal, that's a strategic threat for the species. And that would hit us even before um, the green sky of Peter Ward, you know, not changing the, the, changing the poison in the atmosphere from global warming. I'd also, of course, we have a lot of movies are talking about the asteroid, but that's a serious deal. <laughs> You know, that should be in that, that, that thing. Another one that's not well understood is when the magnetic poles lose their strength in the past, they can switch positions, all right? That's happened before uh, and we can survive that. That's not a strategic threat. It's a problem, <laughs> it's not a strategic threat. What's a strategic threat is there was a study on only one so far that I've seen that shows that the long-term trend of the earth is that the magnetic poles in general are slowly losing their strength. And his projection, 
and there were several, but the worst case projection was that in 500 years, the magnetic poles would weaken enough that we wouldn't be protected from the solar stuff. That's a strategic threat. All right, that's, these are the kinds of things. Another one, the solar could, have, the sun could have a major gamma, gamma ray burst. We've been lucky so far. <laughs> you know, the, the life of the sun, we're just a little piece of time. But it could have, but it could have happened nine months ago and we get hit the next second, <laughs> you know, nine minutes ago. Uh, another is, this is not going away yet, is the nanotech gray goo problem. Uh, the Millennium Project did a study for the Office of Science uh, Department of Energy years ago. We interviewed a, the, the, all the national lab, U.S. national lab head, and we brought that one up. And they'd all say, oh, we're going to be able to ha handle the gray goo problem. But their answers were not very convincing. Not one of the directors came up with an answer that, in my judgment, solved the problem. For those of you who don't know, if, if, if we create nanotech that is able to take oxygen, uh, see a carbon out of the air and reproduce, what stops it? I mean, theoretically, it could just continue on. Another one, remember uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the National Lab in Cold Spring Harbor, Long Island, New York, said they're going to do this subatomic physics uh, 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 experiment. And they said it was a small chance, but a chance it could open up a black hole. Yes, you go back, you go take a look. Cold Spring Harbor National Lab. And, and the scientists brought up the problem themselves. It wasn't anybody else. And as a result, they canceled the experiment because even though this, the thought was just zero, 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 you know, percent, it wasn't zero. Now, we're not slowing down science in that area. We're speeding up science in that area. So we have to look at these things. And when you analyze threat, if it, if it only knocks out half the species, that's one calculation. But if it knocks out everything, that's another calculation. And what I'm saying is these calculations, these activities ought also are integrated. As we make progress in synthetic biology, that affects nanotech, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, uh, what I'm jumping up and down about is that in the concept of human security, which I believe will succeed. I, yeah, I think I, that's a clear path. It's just being smart moving forward. But I worry that the long-term strategic for the species, like the pandemic is not a strategic threat. All right, we can recover. The plague, all the rest of that sort of stuff. But the, some of the ones I've ticked off here can finish this off as a species. And so now to, to your, your first question very quickly, and I know I'm going a little long, uh, about integration. One of the things we did in the Millennium Project was we had these 15 global challenges and we take the earth, we put each one around it and we show lines all over. So uh, the graphic itself has made the point and, and, and communicated very well that the 15 global challenges are interdependent and one is not more important than the other and, and, and it's global. So I would say that one of the things we could probably do is do some sort of a global graphic like that. And what are the key elements? And maybe they're concentric circles. I'm not sure, but there's a lot of ways to do it. But I would stress that the, the understanding of the concept uh, will be put forward by a smart graphic. Thanks. I'd like to uh, come to Peter and pick up on the work at IAP. But before doing that, Katana, I'd just like to put a question to you for thinking about it, as if you don't have enough to think about already. From a business perspective, if a business does not, is not integrated in its thinking and not integrated in its execution of its thinking, things don't happen the way they're supposed to. Uh -huh. Whereas the, the gap in research, if the thinking is not integrated, it may look great on paper. It may even work in an isolated environment, but not taking into a, account all of the extraordinary circumstances. And when it comes to implementation, it may not get implemented or may have totally different consequences. So while I'm asking Peter a question, I wanted you to think about what can we learn from the structural knowledge that's inherent in successful business operations that 
because it's a single organization, it's much more integrated than society is. And we've got research out in, in left field here, or maybe the legislature's out in left field. I'm not sure which one's been right or left. <laughs> and and uh, we've got the implementation agencies somewhere else in the infield. Uh, uh, think about what we might be able to learn from that would be valid. Peter, I wanted to come back to IAP. I'm not sure, I think many of our viewers, attendees may not be as familiar with the wonderful work that you're doing there. But as uh, Krishnan talked about the integration of the different dimensions or disciplines, what, how far uh, uh, have you been able to, or do, do you know of, uh, the, the extension of from the research to the policy making to the actual implementation agencies to the impact, whether it's by civil society or government or whatever, and evaluation. Uh, do you have any programs that are attempting this, what I would call a vertical integration from the research to the implementation? Um, okay, I think the short answer is no, but let, let me give you a couple of um, examples of, of how we're starting to, to manage that. I think I mean, Krishan, for example, mentioned the food and nutrition and hang on, food and food, nutrition security and agriculture project, which um, evolved through four regional reports, you know, Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas, and finished with a global synthesis. And that included many, many scientists, many social scientists, economists, um, biotechnologists, looking at what can happen in the future and so on. E everything from um, indigenous varieties of crops to the future of biotechnology and agriculture and um, precision agriculture, all, all these things. So it's quite a overarching report and series of reports, lots of inputs, and also importantly regionally specific. Because you know, um, just looking, you know, north and south agriculture in Europe is very very different from agriculture in Africa, for example. Um, this was something that emerged through us polling our academies of what, what do you think are the emerging issues that IEP should focus on? And we saw a cluster coming around this, this concept and that, that's why we took it forward. And at that time, it was sort of not on the radar particularly of the, the United Nations of FA, where FAO is always dealing with it, but we didn't sort of connect with them directly at the time. And um, those reports were released 2018, 2019, I think it was. So, but they've been picked up. And right now, uh, you, you may have seen that the UN Secretary General has called for a UN summit on food system security that will happen um, later this year, November this year. And he set up various committees. There is a scientific committee, which is actually being led by the guy, Joaquin von Braun, that led our global study for the IEP study. So um, we have various people from our different continental working groups in the scientific committee. So we sort of preemptively, by scanning the horizon for, with our academies, asking what, what issues were emerging, We've placed ourselves very well um, to have good visibility and hopefully good impact. We're currently preparing, again, some papers, updated papers to feed into this um, some summit that will happen later this year. Um, so there we have managed to verticalize our engagement, if you like, from our national academies right up to the Secretary General's um, Food System Summit. Um, another example is we have a science education group that is really promoting and has done for many years 
this concept of inquiry-based science education, you know, getting kids to, instead of learning by rote, they learn by experimentation and figuring out the answers in teams by experimenting, by seeing what works, what doesn't work, and really the teacher guides rather than informs, if, if you like. And it's, it's been shown to be a very effective way of teaching science. Now, from this group, um, a couple of years ago, we put out an IAP statement. So this is a document prepared by an expert group and endorsed by more than half of our member academies. So we, had, you know, something 60, 70 academies endorsed this statement. It was released at the time of the, the Macron in France was holding a sort of climate summit. You, you may remember maybe three years ago now. Um, and out of that, the French government has started, not only because of our statement, but with other initiatives and lobbying, there is now an office for climate education in Paris that is now also aligned with UNESCO. It is producing um, modules and curricula for teachers based on the IPCC reports. So again, using the latest science to feed in what teachers need to teach the latest science. But a, a key message, and you, you touched on it before, from our statement was this cross-cutting education. So we shouldn't be teaching chemistry. We shouldn't be teaching history. We should be teaching climate change that looks at history, looks at chemistry. Or in the chemistry syllabus, there is a climate change part which integrates with a climate change part of the history syllabus or the, the biology, whatever it might be. So the, the concept of integrating big issues like climate change across all the disciplines in agriculture, in climate change from an early age, you know, getting more complex, obviously, as you go through the, the school system um, is, is proposed in that statement. Um, so there's just two ways of making the connections, I think. So may, maybe I will leave it there and maybe come back later. Very interesting examples and, and comments you've made. In fact, it got my mind thinking about a number of the things that we've seen. Uh, you mentioned the food. Uh, you know, uh, I happen to have uh, had the privilege of knowing the, really the father of the Green Revolution in India, who wasn't a scientist, he was a political leader. Uh, and he had taken the technology from Borlaug's uh, Simit in Mexico, the high yielding varieties. And when he, because India was under threat of a huge famine at that time, 65, uh, FAO predicted 65, 66, because of the droughts that there could be as many as 10 million deaths. That's not very good politics in a democracy with a free press and a, <laughs> a, a judicial, a judicial system. And uh, so, uh, the government was really eager to do something to avoid this calamity. Uh, and he came back with the idea of taking the technology, which was unproven in Indian conditions. And the big obstacle he had there was that the agricultural scientists didn't believe that it was possible. They knew that a great work had been done and Borlaug later got the World Peace Prize for that work because there was no food prize at that time uh, to give him. Uh, and uh, he created the food prize later. Uh, but the scientists said, first of all, it won't grow here. Secondly, even if it grows, our farmers won't grow it because they won't spend more money using to grow a hybrid variety, which costs more to cultivate on the hope of getting higher yields. Thirdly, if they get higher yields, their experience is that in years of bumper crops, uh, the prices collapse and they end up losing money or burning the crops on the road because the prices collapse. And even if they manage to produce it, this is not the kind of wheat that we uh, grow and eat in India. Uh, are, the people won't buy it and they won't eat it. And fortunately, the 
the guy who was the food minister, Sisa Brahminya, a very famous gentleman, said he didn't listen to them. And he said, look, he came from a farming family. He said, and my point is, I have a point in saying it, is the farmer will produce more if he's confident of earning more. Not just a little bit more, but a significantly more. So if we want him to produce this, we're going to have to guarantee him a minimum floor price for what he grows. And we're going to, that's not enough. We're going to have to guarantee him a market for what he grows. And for that, we need a marketing organization that can take the surpluses from Punjab or wherever they come from and market them in deficit areas at a time when the country did not have national agricultural markets. It was all local and regional markets. And so he said, we'll create the marketing organization. We'll create the pricing commission. We don't have enough fertilizer, so we'll create the fertilizer corporation. We don't have enough warehousing. We'll create that. Uh, we don't have... Our agricultural research is all, everybody, every region is focusing on its own thing. We've got a national calamity uh, before us. And he put all of the agricultural research under a central organization, ICAR, uh, and uh, insisted that the national priorities take precedent in the development of national research. And then he said, look, our agricultural scientists are paid much less than our engineers are. It's a low prestige area. He raised the salaries to make them commensurate. And in five years, India, uh, then he did one other thing. He set up 100,000 demonstration plots for the new varieties. And the first ones were set up on the, in the backyards of ministers in Delhi to prove to them that this stuff will grow in India and they can eat it. He announced in parliament that within five years, our goal is food self-sufficiency. And everybody in parliament, his own party laughed at In five years, India actually was a net food exporter. In 10 years, it had doubled its production. Now, the reason I mentioned this is, it comes back to what uh, uh, Krishnan said. Uh, it comes back, it's not just a question of getting all the natural scientists together. What is the science? This, what is the science of knowing how you take an idea and introduce it in a society, in a complex situation, and get it, get the people to respond to it, get the society to be capable of organizing it and managing it, and get it actually to have results? Well, this is not natural science at all. This is social science, this is management, this is organization, this is psychology, this is sociology, this is economics and all. And so the integration to really, if you want to get that great research result and get it implemented in the society by human beings and get the kind of results we need, we really need a knowledge that's not just multidisciplinary at the, at the natural science level, we need it to be a full knowledge, a knowledge, what do we call it? We don't even have a name for that knowledge today uh, that includes and really integrates them all. And that's kind of what we had in mind when we talked about the transdisciplinarity. And, uh, Jerry mentioned a very interesting, in, in his long list of terrifying threats, no matter if we can only be satisfied that probability of any one of them is pretty low. <laughs> we won't talk about the probability of all of them. Uh, but he mentioned, it reminded me of a, another example. Uh, we, a couple of years ago, we were collaborating with IEEE in a conference on cognitive computing and artificial intelligence. And we had a meeting with top people, really top people in the field of cognitive computing in the world from different countries. And, and, I, and we had younger people because they had their students and their researchers come to the meeting as well. And I asked them, uh, tell me, how many of you, when you're learning about artificial intelligence and cognitive computing, are also studying the social implications and social impact of technology? I mean, how many of us imagined when Facebook uh, uh, was started as a nice game uh, to play with the sorority girls 
that we were creating an invention that could destabilize a political system <laughs> and enable uh, and become a greater security threat than all the nuclear weapons in the world. Uh, so what are the implications, whether it's in healthcare or in food, or it's in high technology, or it's in apparently innocuous areas uh, that have nothing, that if we don't have this conceptual integration at the beginning, we serve, it's not a, just a question very of the long-term threats. <laughs> These threats may be right around the corner, but simply they fall outside the periphery of why we created the thing. We created the thing for just a social networking, not as for political espionage or destabilizing other societies. Uh, and yet, uh, so we need to look from that holistic perspective. So uh, very fascinating discussion. And I don't think there's not, I don't think there's simple answers to this, but I think when we talk about the social responsibility of science and the power of the technology and the knowledge we have for good or otherwise, unless our knowledge evolves uh, and our implementation capabilities evolve uh, to be able to control it. And that's the whole debate about, you know, whether Facebook and Twitter have a right to uh, ban Trump from uh, being on, uh, on social media now. Uh, uh, Fortunately, the First Amendment does not apply. Freedom of speech does only applies to government interference. It doesn't prevent companies from <laughs> limiting what they publish. Otherwise, the New York Times would be having to publish all the, the quotes from Fox News. <laughs> mm -hmm. They have a right to say, this is not news to us. Uh, so, but anyway, I'm just, uh, uh, let me go to you, uh, Ketan, and see what the, how this, what this stimulates in your thinking. Thank you, Gary. Um, interesting. I'm going to go back to where you began, Gary. We, we're trying to design, as I understand it, a, a global institute for human security. And you've had a panel talking about the content itself. So this is about how do we get it done, the execution of it. Um, I guess what's missing a little bit from, from the content and if, you know, where, where Jerry touched and where Krishan touched, if I take those as two, two points on the spectrum. Jerry, you spent some time talking about the existential risk to the species. And Krishnan, you, you spoke about matters which um, pertain, I guess, to the living with dignity risk across the species. And so I, I think one of the most fundamental questions from an organizational perspective would be, are, are we, is this institute designed to address the whole spectrum of risk from living with dignity and having material possession of sufficient quality and quantity to lead a meaningful life, all the way to the existential risk to humanity? And if it is, you know, I think the first part might be to describe that mandate and draw the spectrum out and assess in some way its probability. And I don't think we'll have a shortage of people who can analyze the problem. From an execution perspective, I, I think often the problem is that we have too many people who can analyze the problem, but not very many who can solve the problem. And so I think that the, the dilemma you've posed or the challenge you've posed is you want in one institute, the thinking and the execution. And that's, those are two the different- knowledge, The knowledge of the thinking and the execution. Mm -hmm. They may not be the implementing agency. All right, interesting. They should, so, have, they should have the involvement of the people who have to implement. That's okay, true. so that helps because then, these are two different cultures. The, the, the thinking, the research, the very fundamental analysis of what is going on and the dreaming of what might be, is one species maybe. And even then, I think it splits between those who can analyze and those who can dream and imagine. But fine, that's one, one type of thinking. And the second is the execution. And if, if the objective or the mandate of the Institute is to commission the execution, then that's very important because its job is to identify what is important and identify an execution agent that will take it out and get it done. And the right type of policies, and how are you going to persuade the political system to accept those policies? There's a lot, you know, a lot that goes before yes. the actual act. And so, before you could commission, you'd have to have, 
the sort of know-how that could think of how, what the blueprint is, if you like, and how you get things done. So uh, what, who are the agents? What is the capital required? What is the mechanism? And in a, in a multilateral system, how you could galvanize, as you said, the social system to get things ex executed so the world changes. Now, again, these are skills beyond the think tank. The original concept of a think tank during the World War II was a safe place to think and strategize and discuss. But I think what you're talking about is something beyond the think tanks we have today. It is a commissioning agent of change, which is exactly what we, what we need in certainly the next 10 to 15 years of managing a transition, but that could be a 50 year period of man managing a transition from a carbon industrial machine economy to an information knowledge economy where the knowledge will go everywhere and we won't better control where it goes for good or evil. And so from a private sector perspective, some people have grasped that, whether it's a, a SpaceX or a Facebook or an Amazon, or even in the COVID vaccine recently, and they've made the heroic efforts to execute something they thought was important and global and meaningful. But none of them, I would guess, or not many of them, thought they would have the success they've had, but they've been smart enough to navigate the world and, and see the value. I think you're asking for a range of skills to be in this institute, which borrow some of those people and then their, their entrepreneurial financing skills, their thinking skills, perhaps, or actually execution skills. They're thinking about execution skills too. And I think that's possible. I, I think the architecture of that is certainly the, the, the premium thinking, which I'm not sure can resign in any one place today. So whatever that relationship is with other great places of thought. And then the great thinkers and advisors who will help architect how this gets implemented in the world. That's possible too. I think we're beginning to touch on it. Um, but, but it isn't a think tank. It's not because it's got to implement. It's got to see things happen. So it is an action tank of some sort. I'll be interested in listening to Michael Muller tomorrow because what they're doing, they, the way they've overcome this issue is, as I understand it, is for each project, they're recruiting the expertise from anywhere in the world that exists mm. for the project. It's not that they're trying to, as you said, nobody, no institution can have all of this knowledge, yes. but any institution can mobilize the knowledge of the world for a particular issue from these different levels, not just the technology of it, but the policy and political and economic and social and ecological consequences of it. You're then creating, I guess, a hub from which things go out and happen. And if that's the World Academy, I think you could, you could conceive it to do that because you're already taking the steps in that direction. Um, and look, it, there is no shortage of capital to do it. But if you want that, you know, if you want that, a very small amount of that capital are actually in the hands of government. Um, uh, probably only 10 to 15% of the capital is in the hands of governments to deploy. The rest of it is in private hands and individual hands. And so to deploy it, they, they would need to be engaged to understand the risk and the benefits and the returns of doing so. If this was to be the powerful in, you know, initiator of big change. And so. But I, I could imagine that architecture already from what we've discussed, I could imagine that. And of course, we're not talking about one or one institution. We're really yeah. trying to think futuristically yeah. about what our research institutions need to be in the future. Yes. We've almost already- a, Almost a meta institution in some ways, a meta organizer, rather than a replicator <laughs> of so much knowledge that exists out there. Yeah, I could see the idea of outsourcing and take a little like chapter out of NASA's development is that you had people in NASA, massive management problem as you, you know, look back on it, is, you know, you're, you're managing all what needs to be done and implementing, but the actual building of the rocket ship, and the actual, you know, that's all outsourced. Yeah. So you say, who's got the best idea on X, yes. but... 
the institute or the unit or whatever has to say, this is a problem that has no good answers. And you can outsource uh, a lot of this stuff. Okay. But I like your distinction between uh, implementing and research. I think that's, I think we should hold that idea throughout the whole conversation. In a sense, we need to have research about the implementation, <laughs> not just sure. research about the Absolutely. Thing, Absolutely. About the politics and the political decisions. Absolutely. And the administrative and the financial and everything else. And I Absolutely. assume that uh, Katan is in, uh, is in your work with Goldman on strategy. I think the strategy could be really if it's going to get implemented, it has mm -hmm. to go at one stage through all of these steps of knowledge, not just mm -hmm. to see that things work on paper. They have to work according right. to law. They have to co conform with, with customer needs and expectations and, yes. and, and so forth. I, I, I we have some two more. Go ahead. I, but we have two more speakers, so I want to at least. I want I, I'm to keep very short. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You, you're almost creating a holding company. Mm -hmm. or changing the world. It's a holding company. It's not professing to have the, all the best ideas or answers. Who could? It's not professing to have all the money or professing to have all the solutions or the execution capability, but it is the holding company of human security along the full spectrum, and it wishes to commission the right people to get it done. That's right. And I, I think that's a, that's a, that's a great thought to, to see if we could figure out how to get that done. Because no people have too much ego vested in thinking they are the right people to get it done, mm -hmm. have the best thinking. But if we don't have that, we can actually leverage the world. Absolutely. It's the world's thinking we want. The core knowledge we need, and the core knowledge such an institution needs is the process of getting things done <laughs> at all the stages, whether you call that management or accomplishment or anything else. And that has all the different dimensions of how do we mobilize society and individuals and organizations to act in an anticipated way. That regardless of whether it's in agriculture or in high tech, uh, that knowledge would be essential. And in this case with Facebook as a classic example or the pandemic which covers everything, that knowledge necessary is as big as the world, yes. but better we anticipate as much as we can anyway, uh, uh, so uh, we know what we're doing. So Shanat, any thoughts that have come to you? I know this is an undis unstructured topic. I didn't know how to describe it before we started, but what comes to your mind? Oh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, good evening, and thank you for uh, hosting this uh, very important um, panel and, and conference. Uh, I see you've been talking about creating a global institute for human security. I'm sure that all of you are aware that the United Nations has a framework for global security and it's based on uh, General Assembly Resolution 66290, where they define human security as an approach to assist member States in identifying and addressing widespread and cross-cultural challenges to the survival, livelihood, and dignity of their people. It calls for people-centered, comprehensive, contact-specific, and prevention-oriented responses that strengthen the protection and empowerment of all people. I'm sure that you are engaged with them as well. Um, the UN mandate for human security calls for promoting multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships, which you have been discussing. Um, the UN documentation notes that to assure human security, we need to draw together the expertise and resources of a, a wide range of actors from the United Nations system, governments, private sector, civil society, and local communities. Again, this is what you have been discussing mainly in the areas of, um, again, uh, human security is defined by the UN and, and uh, academics as freedom from fear and dignity and wants. At the uh, Interparliamentary Coalition for Global Ethics, we are basically uh, emphasizing um, UN SDG um, uh, item number 16, that in order to uh, implement and uh, to uh, accomplish human security, you need a just and peaceful society. 
So um, the Interparliamentary Coalition for Global Ethics has been established with the goal of inviting parliamentarians from all UN member states to commit to work to implement the universal values of global ethics for the culture of peace, environmental protection, and social justice, international legislation. Um, these global ethics, which have been uh, inscribed in UN General Assembly resolutions are values which we share and require national legislation to be implemented. The coalition endeavors to promote the implementation of these resolutions by engaging for the first time religious leaders, parliamentarians, media and academic leaders who search for common values um, and to work together and individually to implement the UN resolutions for the culture of peace, environmental protection and social justice through fostering initiatives, projects and collaborations in all these fields. Um, basically, uh, uh, you have been discussing a framework uh, for all of this, uh, probably in collaboration with uh, the United Nations. Um, the United Nations calls, uh, lists in its definition of uh, human security prevention, the crucial role of prevention and uh, resilience. Um, to that end, um, I have, when I met uh, Dr. Khan, who is uh, the uh, director of the UN uh, Counterterrorism Counter Implementation Force at a conference um, of the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria in 2015, I mentioned to him our emphasis on promoting national legislation for the culture of peace. Uh, the L SDGs were not developed at that time. And he thought it was a very good idea. And he said he'll include it in the UN plan of action to prevent violent extremism, which is a resolution 76, I think 674 adopted in uh, 2016. So um, to that end, um, we have uh, advanced uh, and include um, in our promotion uh, with the various parliamentarians, uh, the need for mandatory legislation for mandatory education for the culture of peace and the SDGs. Um, I, in the beginning, I mean, as far when we started, the uh, human security issues were largely aimed at the areas of conflict and post-conflict. However, political and uh, social and, and, and pandemic issues since uh, then have developed. They have proven um, the need for mandatory education for the culture of peace and SDGs to all countries and all nations um, that face both, both physical and um, uh, social upheavals and conflicts. And uh, this basically en encompasses all of the UN member states. Um, in 2019, the member, um, members of the Council of Europe um, issued a written declaration supporting uh, the IPCGE um, initiative. We met with the president of the um, Council of Europe uh, to discuss this fur further. We are forming alliances across the globe, um, establishing parliamentary caucuses and alliances with uh, religious education, um, and social um, uh, NGOs uh, in order to, uh, we are working with Dr. Alberto Zucconi, who is um, uh, your partner. You are your, a partner um, with, you're a partner with us. We're your partner. Right. So the, basically the challenge now is to create um, a curriculum, a model curriculum, which we can post online. One of our, we've been working very closely in partnership in some cases with UNESCO and various other international um, institutes and NGOs. And of course, the primary one is World Academy um, and the um, consortium, university, uh, World University Consortium of Dr. Alberto Zucconi to create this um, uh, model curriculum, which would be available for all nations and all societies to adapt to their own uh, values and um, culture. Um, and we hope that uh, you will join us in this effort. One of, uh, uh, one of let's say a very small um, example of what we're, we hope to do is to have, um, in, in order to incorporate the youth in this, uh, um, endeavor is to have a global art competition on uh, the art of living in peace, which uh, will get them thinking about it. And they're the leaders of the future. So um, hopefully we can work together to accomplish this. Thank For you. Sure. Thank you so much. Sophie. You're doing wonderful work and um, we have great admiration for 
RPC Relief. Thank you. And the same for us. And, and congratulations to World Academy at the 60th anniversary. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yuri, um, we saved the best for last. Uh, please share your thoughts with us. Thank you, Gary. Uh, my uh, greetings to all co panelists. Maybe not so known as the others. This is why short introduction. I'm uh, working at the Moscow State University. I am head of the UNESCO chair on global problems. I am a member of the Academy and of the Club of Rome and of other institutions. But uh, what is uh, maybe more important, it is that uh, since uh, the inception of the project of global security and of human security. Uh, we are trying to work together on it. We organized uh, last year two important events, forum in May and forum in December, especially on human security. And uh, it was a kind of preparatory events for the session of today. Uh, in the previous session, I spoke uh, about one of the threats, because there are many. I spoke about the threat, which I consider as a very important, if not the most important one, it is intellectual degradation. And uh, there is the whole list of threats. And uh, there is a, a number of institutions dealing with it. The only thing is that, as Gary properly said, all this is fragmented. All this is uh, working sometimes in parallel. And um, the initiative, which I consider a great initiative, which was undertaken by the World Assembly, it was a project uh, joined with UN in Geneva on uh, the security, on global leadership. And uh, the idea was born of the Institute, but I am afraid the Institute alone will not manage, will not be enough for this uh, uh, giant task. What um, could be proposed? I can uh, try to draft a kind of picture of or a scheme uh, on it. I think the Institute and the World Assembly should be the core, should be a kind of heart of the whole mechanism. But it should be amended, of course. It should be amended by networks. And uh, I would uh, propose a kind of vision of how it could function. First, I think. Uh, this should be a global network, World Assembly Global Network on Human Security. The institutions, research institutions, academies, universities, centers, and many others should be invited to join this network. It could be on the principle of a real network. Each element of the network is equal to all other elements. It means there is no directive center, all, are, all the whole scheme is working, and there is a coordinator, World Academy, and its institute. Then I think it is important to have national platforms in countries and maybe platforms in international organizations, especially in organizations interested in global security problems. ENGOs and intergovernmental organizations should be invited to participate in it. Another important part of this network would be UNESCO chairs. There are about 800 UNESCO chairs today in the world on various topics. I can open a secret, which is not a secret, 
my chair is the only one in the world dealing with global problems and emerging social and ethical challenges. There is a lot of chair of chairs on human rights, on other things, 20 on water and so on. All this is important and all of them can, con can contribute. This is why I think we can think about this network, about all components. Of course, it can not be born as Aphrodite uh, in one moment. It is a hard work for a certain period of time. But I think it is manageable for all of us. And in this way, we can do also what I proposed in the previous session. We can restore a real scientific diplomacy. The diplomacy of uh, uh, Bertrand Russell, the diplomacy of Albert Einstein, of Robert Oppenheimer, of Peter Kapitza, and of many others who helped to prevent the catastrophe, uh, catastrophic development. And uh, I think uh, there should be also some uh, important ideas which uh, could be elaborated by uh, this uh, future community of people doing research on human security. First, it is necessary to compose a little list of threats because there are many. When at the end of the 80s, of the, of the 1980s, when I used to be the first deputy chairman of the Committee of Soviet Scientists, a huge organization united scientific research in the Soviet Union, we elaborated a list of threats uh, of global security threats. It was uh, energetic security, military security, political security, food security, and so on. All together, if I'm not mistaken, 12 or 13 positions, new threats as well. Today, there are much more threats. There were more multiplied in the meantime during this 30 years or so on. And uh, it is necessary to make a new list. Then it is uh, very useful to have a database, maybe various databases. First could be database on individuals who will be working on it with contacts, with possibilities of discussions. When uh, I was counselor to our president of the Russian Academy of, Science, of Sciences, and he was in the group selected by the UN Secretary General to draft the new global agenda, all those 26 or 27 scientists, there were a, each moment in interconnection. When even one was writing to another one, all this was transmitted to all members of the group in order to elaborate joint thinking on it, to, let us say, to overcome the gap, overcome the fragmentation of things, of thoughts and of research. This is why uh, maybe uh, it could uh, seem to be unrealistic and uh, somehow uh, ideal uh, or not manageable, but you know, ideals, uh, they have such a uh, ability. When you are trying to work with them, they can turn into reality. And this is my desire for World Academy. Gary, you are great. You know, in Russia, there is a, there is a saying, may, maybe you will not understand it. You are the greatest after Pushkin. Because we consider Pushkin as a poet, the greatest one. But you are really a poet of security and especially of human security. And I congratulate you with this uh, really very necessary and uh, great project. Thank you so much. Yuri, thank you so much for what your, your idea, your conception is very exciting and you'll be very eager to 
learn more about it and think it through with you and collaborate in any way we can. You really are a global thinkers. Uh, okay. And uh, there are not that many in the world who are specialized. In, and I'm sure we can do something wonderful together. Thank you so much for joining us. We have just two or three minutes left. Uh, if anyone has a, a deep urge to add something to this very, very rich discussion, which is already done. Yes. One sure. short one. Don't forget threat opportunity. A I database agree. lends itself to that. So if we just look at threat, we're going to knock out the unconscious mind of civilization. We got that threat opportunity, threat opportunity. And it's very interesting to have his threat and there's no opportunities. Well, that tells you something. Wonderful. And many times they, or maybe mostly they come together. No? <laughs> the threat should Hold come on. to an opportunity or the <laughs> vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Great wisdom in that. Just, I want to thank our panel for a very, very rich and interesting discussion. I didn't know where we were going to start or where we were going to come out, but I have enjoyed it immensely. Thank you.